Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Carlton Tower, Jamira. Oh, and Alex is already on the stage. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Have I come in too early? <laughs> That's fine. I think we can move on. So we're going to dive straight into some questions and answers. Alex, um, on the topic of uh, Silverstone, we understand Williams Racing will be celebrating its 800th Grand Prix. What does this race and the British Grand Prix mean to you and to the team? Yeah, well, firstly, you know, 800 GPs, it's, it's, a, it's no mean feat. And I think there's only two other teams older than, than us. So, you know, seeing the team and hearing about the heritage, I don't know if anyone's ever had the chance to go to Williams, but the factory, the museum they have to see all the old cars and to see the process and the journey they've gone through. And, you know, they've had their ups and downs and it's great to s kind of see that in history. And right now we, we are, I'd like to think we're on the up, but yeah, no, it is special. And also for me, Silverstone, is where I grew up around, well, I didn't grow up in Silverstone, but um, it was where I, where I first learned my, my license. So you get your driver's license. Um, I got it when I was eight years old. So they give it to you a bit earlier than your, than your driver's license. But um, it was basically in the corner of one of the main corners, there is a, uh, a casting section. And uh, I used to grow up and practice in this casting area and they basically teach you what does a yellow flag, what is a yellow flag, what is a red flag. And so I got my license that day um, and there was a Formula One car driving around the track at the same time. And I just remember thinking there's no way. It actually intimidated me to listen to the car because it was so noisy. I was seven years old and I thought, oh, I, ca I can't do that. But here I am. And so speaking about that and speaking about, you know, thinking that you can't do that, now that you are doing that, what is it like when you're actually you know, in behind the wheel? What, what is your body going through when you're, when you're performing at that, sp at that speed? It's, it's strange because, like I, because you, you know, like I said, you start when you're seven, eight years old. And as you go through the ranks, um, the driving bit's the easiest bit. It's the bit that feels the most natural. So I found it very, I don't want to say easy, but, but the speed and the feeling of Formula One feels quite normal just because speed is, is kind of ingrained into your body. It's, it's almost like riding a bike. If you went to ride a bike, for, for most people, it's, it's quite natural. For me, speed, there is no fear attached to it. it it's just driving. What, what I struggled with was everything else. So, you know, like, like this kind of stuff, doing, doing public speaking or all the marketing we had to do, the media and, and you know, a lot of toxic media on top of that, that when you're when you're starting in Formula One, that's what I struggled with. Um, and as you spend time and time and, and get used to it, you kind of, I think you don't care. You just spend, you, you know, you're, un you're under the light a bit more than, than you were before. And I'm, I'm actually quite an introverted person. So in the beginning, it was particularly hard. But as you as you spend more time in it, you, you get used to it. And so feeling more comfortable on the track and, and driving the race car, Silverstone itself, what does that track feel like? And how does it compare to some of the others that you race in uh, during the year? Yeah, we, we, we go th to some not so great circuits. A lot of them are kind of city built and they, they will try and find a few, what is the checkered flag? What does your right foot do? What does your left foot do? That kind of stuff, alleyways and, and call it a track, which tends to mean that you're driving around 90 degree corners because obviously most cities are built in that kind of cross grid way. That's not to have a go at any like American track, but that's, that's, kind, <laughs> of the, that's kind of the way it goes. So when you come to Silverstone and it's, it's so high speed, there's so many corners, um, but, but it's not just the corners, it's the undulation and the character of the track, the flow. It's, it's quite hard to explain, but every driver loves going to Silverstone. There's not many tracks we go to where you can truly appreciate what a Formula One car can do because the speeds, the corner speeds aren't there, but Silverstone is like, basically like driving a roller coaster. You, you, the, the, the sensation is a roller coaster, but you're in charge of where the roller coaster goes. That's kind of what I say. And so speaking of that, Cops Corner, big corner in Silverstone. Yeah. What's it like coming out that corner at 175 miles an hour? Logan and I, we did a little bet at the start of the year. So we, we shook the car down at Silverstone. And so the first thing is to do it flat as quick as you can. So I think on the outlap, we, we already started, I tried it flat and we got away with it. So, so doing the stuff like that, I think this, we don't tell the team that, but um, <laughs> that's, that's just a driver bet. But yes, it, it is amazing. And the forces we go through, to the neck, that, that's actually where Silverstone is, is really aggressive because, because the corners are so quick and non-stop. You're, you're, you're even turning down the straights in some corners. For example, Maggots and Beckett's as you go through. So uh, it's, it's actually quite a physical one as well. And so there has been talk uh, about maybe there being a street circuit in London. 
Would you be open to that, or would you prefer it to, to stay at Silverstone? I'd love there to be both. I'd love, I'd love, I'd love Silverstone to stay. You know, we, we're going to America quite a lot now, and that, that's that's a nice thing to to do. But um, it would be lovely to to race around London as well. Um, I don't know how you would work with the traffic though. So uh, <laughs> it would have to be. I don't know. Is there anywhere quiet in London? I don't think so. Like, and so you know, you're flying around uh, the track. You know, you're there's so many things going on, and then you're coming into pits. What are you thinking about in those two, three seconds when the, when the car is off the ground? Not too much. It's more just thinking about, I hope the team do a good job. It's quite selfish at, in that sense. You're always fighting people just before the pits and after the pits. It's always the area where the race is happening. Because a lot of the circuits, unfortunately, that we go to, we can't overtake that much. So the pit stop becomes where the overtaking happens, the before and after. So um, as you go into the pit lane, you know, the mechanics feel that pressure too. You, you, you know they do. Um, you know, they, they know they have to nail it to beat the cars around them that they're racing. So, uh, so that's it. But, it, but it, in the same time for us, it is an opportunity to rest because we are, um, you know, we're tense in that moment. And, and when you're in the pit lane, it's a little bit of a respite for us. And I guess the, the attention comes onto the team more than, more than the driver. And speaking of the team, uh, you know, the team have been doing a great job this year. Um, upgrades to the car. We've seen great results in the last couple of uh, races. Um, how do you feel about the car moving forward? Basically, we started the year in a great place. We scored a point for the first race, which for us is obviously, it's a big deal. And then we went through kind of a lull. So, it, so we, we did struggle from kind of race two to, I don't even know what race we're on now, but let's call it race six. Um, and then for, from kind of race seven and eight, we bought this upgrade package. Straight away, we scored points in Canada, which was for us one of the an amazing race for us and then as we came into to Red Bull Ring last week we we had a great race in Austria we didn't score points but it was still a great race and now it's kind of like a development race because um, we brought our major upgrade two races ago and others are starting to, to bring theirs now into Silverstone and beyond so it's almost like a period of time where you almost feel like I don't want to say time's running out but you really want to capitalize whilst you have an upgrade before everyone else has theirs to, to get them points. So, you know, Silverstone is also one of these races where we're going to try and optimize the weekend because, you know, our next upgrade's due in, I don't want to give out secrets, but, <laughs> but later, later. So, uh, so, yeah, you know, our biggest upgrade will be next year, but for now it's um, little things until the rest of the year. I'm glad you didn't show. We are recording this. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Other teams are watching this. I don't know. Is this a live stream? No. You talked about uh, traveling to America quite a lot now. Obviously, it's, uh, the Formula One circuit is all around the world. Uh, and you've traveled, obviously, around the world. You've stayed at some of the Jamira properties as well. Are there any tips to you know, how to get over jet lag? How do you relax? How do you unwind when you are doing so much travel throughout the year? Yeah, we're, I would say drivers, we're kind of big divas when it comes to travel. We have a sleep doctor, a nutritionist, um, and together they kind of work out a plan for us. So we... Especially some, you know, some races, for example, we were in um, Azerbaijan, in, in Baku, and then the next week we were in Miami. So we shifted eight or nine hours in time zone, and we were racing um, one week to the next. And we'll do the same thing in Vegas. So in Vegas, we'll race, oh, and then the next week after, we're in Abu Dhabi. So we'll have these, these insane time zones. And it's really important, our rest, basically, because you know, driving these cars, the reaction time and all this kind of stuff, it does get affected with jet lag. And so it's all about trying to maximize that, that kind of that rest period. So, you know, just getting on top of it, we, we have almost this schedule. You know, we have like a marketing schedule, but we also have a, a sleep schedule and eat schedule. And it's all just trying to find these pockets where we're, we're resting and we will block out times where no one can kind of touch me and, you know, cannot pull me to do something. Um, but at the same time, even things like, you know, exposure to light and whatever. If you see a driver with sunglasses on, in an airport. Um, it's not normally because he's a diva. It's more because he's just trying to get, have a jet lag plan that he's trying to, to adjust to. I'm not sure. Maybe, I'm sure there are some drivers who... <laughs> I don't want to name any, but <laughs> there will be some who are wearing glasses, but yeah. It'll be like a race from like Italy to, to Spain and he's wearing his glasses. That's <laughs> you have to tell us afterwards. Yeah. But at that, that point, they're flying PJ. So, so anyway, not, not, not us, unfortunately. Not yet. Well, we do a little, though. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe speaking a little bit about uh, how you take care of yourself, the hair, change color again. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, so I flew in 
Where were we? Very boring. Um, I flew in on Monday. My family hate my hair. And uh, they, my mum was getting her hair cut at her normal place and suddenly arrived to my house and the, the, her hairdresser was at my house with the chair ready. Uh, basically, I had no option but to sit on the chair and uh, sh she dyed it that day. I can't tell you, but it didn't look very good. I did sim yesterday and then after the sim, I, I had to call um, the hairdresser and say, do you mind just changing it a little bit? So I've, had to, I've gone to the hairdresser twice in two days, Monday and Tuesday. So I've put a lot of effort into this. It doesn't look like it, but I have. <laughs> Uh, but yes, but my, my hair has has um, has died, so I bleached it um, after Monaco. I don't know why I'm telling you a hair story, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I bleached it and it came out like this color that I, I don't even know. It was it was purple at the top, which is fine because I think that goes away after a while. <laughs> but it then went bright bright orange, and then it went into like a like a like a like a white, which is what I wanted it to be. Um, but I looked like, is it Guy Fury? Is it that, that kind of like, I looked, I looked really bad. And, um, and I had a race soon after, so I had to fix it. So I bleached it again the day after, which is like, I don't know if any girls are here, but, but you shouldn't bleach your hair twice in a row, <laughs> down, to, down to your scalp. It's really painful, really, really painful. And then I thought my hair was going to fall out, and it didn't. But now my hair's just, I'm, I'm definitely going to go bald soon. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. So not a diva, it's what we're not saying. Not a diva, not a diva, no. Um, and so for those peop uh, people here who don't know, uh, your partner is a professional golfer. Yeah. You also enjoy playing golf. Does, yeah. she, le does she let you win? Um, no, she doesn't. We're f a fiercely competitive couple. So she, is, um, she plays on the LPGA Tour. Um, she's actually at Pebble Beach this week, I think. They're, they're playing. Well, I know. I, sh I should know. And um, yeah, she's, uh, it was one of them things when we first started, I wanted to beat her. I knew I had no chance to beat her at golf and, I, and I'm not a good golfer at all. Um, but you still believe, you still think you can. And then as we started playing, I got really, really frustrated to begin with because it was just, I was, I was, she was kind of showing me up and I kind of looked like an idiot because also her friends were also good at golf. So then she would bring me along and then I'm this guy who's dropping a ball every single hole, um, hitting it in everywhere. Um, and then we did a pro-am together, um, and that was really embarrassing. And so I thought I'd better sort myself out. Um, and she's tried to teach me, um, but because she's my girlfriend, I don't listen to her. That's, that's, the, that's the big problem. So now I've had to get lessons. But I am, I am improving, but I'm still not very good. So we are here, obviously, at the uh, Carlton Tower Jamira. We've uh, had some, some afternoon tea. I think the big question for you would be uh, for scones. We're going clotted cream and then jam or jam and then clotted cream? Oh God, there's only one way. Ah, uh, uh, no, uh, <laughs> Cream first? Yeah. Yes? <laughs> I see I see like a 50-50. Like a uh, it's good here though. I'm, I'm on a strict diet and uh, upstairs, in the, we were doing some filming earlier and they had, uh, they had some amazing cakes. So they packaged the box and my trainer's not here this, today, so I'll sneak them in <laughs> before tomorrow, but yeah. Alex, thank you so much for your insights. No it was lovely to meet you and lovely thank to you. have you here. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.